This is the JLPT Bootcamp Podcast. This is episode 97, and I am your host, Mac. Uh, this is a special culture episode. Um, I usually do two podcasts a month. One's about culture, and the other one is uh, kind of my current game plan for studying for the JLPT. Currently, I'm studying for N1, um, but uh, I go over strategies and things like that in another podcast. This podcast, I'm going to focus on culture. And today's uh, topic is this misconception about um, geisha. I, I happen to live in uh, Kyoto, which is a very famous city for being traditional. Um, there's a lot of traditional arts that are still alive. You can go to tea ceremony if you'd like. Uh, there's, um, you know, you can uh, ride a um, jinrikisha or rickshaw. Um, as you might know, uh, around the city, you can. There's tons of uh, temples to see, beautiful sites that are very traditional Japanese. If you think about traditional Japan, uh, Kyoto pretty much has everything that you can imagine in that city, and um, it's a little famous for uh, geisha. Um, there's especially the Gion district. Um, is kind of well known for geisha and uh, geisha sometimes conjures up this image of um, they are professional prostitutes basically and uh, that's um, that's really actually quite far from the truth uh, in fact the word geisha um, means something like art doer the the, the first part uh, gay that that kanji means art or artistic and sha means uh, a person who does that a, a professional that does that thing so it's you can basically translate it as an artist and actually they have to go through several years of expensive training uh, to become a full geisha um, there's even today there's a series of uh, training that they have to go through, um, different levels that they have to move up through in order to become a full geisha. Now, before uh, the 20th century, girls started training as early as four, and this was really a choice by their parents. Um, the, of course, uh, nobody knows at the age of four what they want to do for the rest of their life. Uh, so it was basically... Um, their parents uh, or somebody else has kind of chosen for them um, in this uh, life as being a geisha with the understanding that they would have a better life than uh, what they could provide for them if uh, they weren't geisha, if they were just, um, you know, working in the field and getting married or whatnot. So um, it was a it was a really uh, great opportunity in the past for uh, women to move up in society, to have a lot of money, to uh, do what they want to do. Um, of course, in modern Japan, becoming a geisha is, is a personal choice. It's made by girls uh, after completing middle school, high school, or uh, college. And geisha still today learn the traditional arts like uh, playing shamisen, um, sh shakuhachi, which I'm not quite sure what that is, but um, an instrument, and the, the drums. Um, they also learn other traditional arts like calligraphy, uh, dances, and tea ceremony. Um, lots of different art, basically. And in modern Japan, uh, you'll, you will rarely see geisha on the street. Um, I think the statistic goes something like uh, pre-World War II, um, the, it, there was about 80,000 or so um, uh, geisha operating in Japan, um, which is a huge number. And uh, now today, there's that number is around 1,000. I saw a couple different numbers here and there, and nobody really knows for sure uh, because it's kind of a secretive um, group. Uh, but uh, it's somewhere around a thousand um, uh, women are uh, working as geisha, full-time geisha, um, currently in modern Japan. And uh, so you won't usually see them on the street in Kyoto. If you go to visit Kyoto and you see 
uh, somebody dressed up with uh, all the makeup, the white makeup and the, um, the full kimono and everything, you're probably seeing tourists who have paid to dress up as a geisha. There's a few um, places in Kyoto, uh, one or two places that you can go to, they'll dress you up like a geisha or if you're a man they'll dress you up like a, a samurai and then you can walk around town as those characters and um, obviously get a lot of pictures uh, taken of you because people think that uh, you are either real geisha or um, they, they just want to see real Japan. Um, I've, I've always seen lots of tourists taking tons of pictures of uh, the fake geisha um, which is always uh, kind of interesting. Um, anyway, uh, nowadays geisha now perform at tea houses uh, like they did in the past or uh, traditional Japanese restaurants and they're paid by uh, the number of incense sticks that burn during their performance um, and different geisha have different uh, what they call senkodai uh, or incense stick fee <laughs> for the very inelegant English translation but basically there's a, a fee that's paid for every incense stick that is burnt uh, during their performance when they're performing at the Japanese restaurants or at the the tea house and um, I believe if you if you want to uh, have a geisha perform at your uh, gathering uh, you have to book that through the central um, geisha agency uh, I think there's an agency in Kyoto and uh, one up in uh, Tokyo where um, the the geisha perform now, there have been a few non-Japanese uh, geisha in Japan. Um, the most notable Western is uh, a woman by the name of uh, Fiona Graham, who is from Australia. And she came to Tokyo to become a full-time geisha, mostly for anthropology. Um, she, she was, uh, I think, that was the f first... Uh, the main reason why she got into it. Um, she started uh, doing the training and things um, so she could uh, report on that and write about it. Um, and then it kind of what happened was she became a full geisha but um, there was a little bit of a falling out because uh, the uh, as, as, uh, Asakusa Asakusa um, a geisha Association disaffiliated her because they believed that she never um, wanted to become a full-time geisha. Uh, so they let her become, let her do the training, let her go through it, uh, and then uh, in February of uh, 2011 they uh, unfortunately disaffiliated her, which is um, a little odd, <laughs> I guess. But um, it would be interesting to see uh, more uh, non-Japanese in the uh, in the tradition. Um, there are currently two uh, non-Japanese geisha um, that are from, uh, I think, Russia um, that are performing now. But they, uh, um, but there's there's no Westerners. Um, because uh, Fiona Graham was uh, disaffiliated. So you might be wondering through this whole story uh, about geisha, how, how did this misconception come about? Because um, geisha uh, aren't prostitutes. Um, they actually aren't allowed to... Um, I, th I think they're, of course, allowed to marry, but... Once they are married, uh, they have to quit the profession. They can no longer be geisha. And they can't exactly be uh, dating or anything like that. So it's, it's a little bit more of a controlled life uh, than most people might think. And um, so this, this conception of them being professional prostitutes uh, came from shortly after World War II, uh, during the occupation, there weren't very many real geisha uh, performing and working in Japan. And um, there was a lot of American GIs uh, and basically 
since uh, prostitution was actually legal in Japan until about 1958, the there was um, some women in Japan that uh, um, fashioned themselves as geisha girls and uh, became pro professional prostitutes under that kind of uh, moniker. And so that's how the the geisha word kind of um, uh, got uh, downgraded into this uh, kind of lower profession um, and uh, kind of took away some of the respect for that profession, at least in the, our, the Western world. So um, it's really interesting because I think uh, the same is kind of true now in Japan. There's a couple different levels of the red light district in Japan. And of course, a lot of things go on in the red light district. Um, there's uh, hostess clubs, which are kind of the um, in host clubs for, um, for women to go to. There's hostess clubs for men to go to. Um, and these are kind of... Uh, they kind of have come from the geisha culture because how they're paid is uh, how many bottles of um, uh, drink they drink sometimes or it's uh, it, there's a sitting fee of some kind where uh, somebody has to pay a, a very large amount of money usually around usually around 20,000 or 30,000 yen for uh, two hours or uh, even more um, for that uh, privilege of sitting there and uh, talking to um, some lovely ladies in a bar, so um, it's 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 kind of interesting that it has uh, it's come to this uh, into the the modern age that way, and um, I would like to see um, kind of the, the 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 name you know geisha being. A little bit more respected because it is a highly trained position. Um, it's really difficult to become a full-time geisha. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of training. Um, there's a uh, there's a very uh, hierarchical uh, system that they have to move through in order to uh, become, uh, you know, very popular and make a lot of money and be successful as a, a as a geisha girl as a geisha. So. Um, yeah, it's a tough industry. If you are uh, ever in Japan, I encourage you to um, maybe there's a, a there's a few times a year where there are some geisha shows that you can go to and watch them perform dances uh, and music and things like that. They're open for the public, so you don't exactly have to uh, pay the large incense stick fee that you normally would to see a geisha perform. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it for me about culture this week. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed um, uh, listening to um, some information about geisha.